Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Doris Bergen, the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies here at the University of Toronto. And I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you to this special event, the annual Wolf Lecture on the Holocaust held this year on January 27th, International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'll be moderating the discussion today, together with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Nadav Sharon, our Judaica librarian at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. Nadav, over to you. Thank you, Doris. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to join Professor Bergen in welcoming all of you uh, as here today this afternoon for this special event. Um, as Doris said, my name is Nadav Sharon, and I'm here at the Thomas Fisher Book Library. Before we begin, I would like to introduce uh, the university's chief librarian, Larry Alfred, who's joined us here today, and who will acknowledge the land upon which, which we work and make some introductory remarks. Sorry, I just realized after all these times on Zoom, I was muted. So good afternoon and thank you, Nadav. Uh, I am Larry Alford. I'm the University Chief Librarian here at the University of Toronto. And I want to join my colleagues, Professor Doris Bergen, the Wolf Chair of Holocaust Studies, and Dr. Nadav Sharon, the Ju Judaica Hebraica Librarian at the Fisher Rare Book Library and welcoming your presence with us on this important day. I, uh, Nadav and I are actually in the Fisher uh, physically. We're sorry that others can't be here. Uh, but we're, we're delighted to have all of you here with us on Zoom, and hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to join each other again in person. As we begin today, I want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates and where I am sitting today in the Fisher Library. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Windat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many, many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and in my case, to live on this land. Um, I also would ask that you, uh, as, as we begin this program, that you think about uh, the, the original stewards of the land on which you may be sitting wherever you are in the world uh, and the responsibilities to that land and to those communities. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome you once more to the annual Wolf Lecture on the Holocaust as we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This afternoon's panel discussion has been made possible by the efforts of many, and I would like to take a few moments to express my gratitude to them. First, I want to thank the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, one of the largest centers, most important centers for Jewish studies in North America, for co-sponsoring this event with the University of Toronto Libraries. The study of the Holocaust is one of the most significant components of the Center for Jewish Studies and Professor Doris Bergen, who has, as has been said, is the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Chair of Holocaust Studies at the Center. So thank you, Professor Bergen, for co-moderating this afternoon's discussion. I'd also like to thank Dr. Nadav Sharon, our Judea Judaica Hebraica librarian at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. Uh, many of our friends of the Fisher Library who have been attending virtual events with us for the last for the past 18 months, have not yet had the opportunity to meet Nadav in person. Uh, he joined the Fisher in January of 2020. Uh, I know that many of you uh, uh, who are friends of the Fisher uh, will join me, join me in hoping that we're gonna be able soon to meet uh, Nadav and everyone else in person uh, on the campus and in the libraries. Before coming to Toronto, Nadav obtained his PhD in ancient Jewish history from Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 2013 and worked as a selector of Judaica and Israeliana English books at the National Library of Israel. He came to the University of Toronto in 2014 to do his postdoctoral work at the Center for Jewish Studies. And in 2019, he completed his Master of Information at the Faculty of Information here at the University of Toronto. Since assuming the role of Judaica librarian, he has brought wonderful energy um, and his extraordinary scholarly background and knowledge to his responsibilities. Uh, in curating and building our collections in Judaica and Hebraica. He continues to do, do critical work around highlighting and raising awareness of these important collections, not just locally to our faculty and students here, but across Canada and around the world, uh, as well as helping to acquire amazing additions to these collections. 
Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, I've not met him personally, but Professor Elaine Goldschläger for donating to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, one of the world's largest and most diverse collections of Holocaust memoirs. It is an extraordinary collection and we are deeply honored to be able to, to, to host and preserve this collection um, at the University of Toronto and in the Fisher Library. Professor Goldschläger, your work, your passion and your generosity has made this afternoon's event possible in a singular way. And on behalf of the entire University of Toronto community, uh, the libraries, the, the university itself, I wanna thank you for helping us to remember what must never be forgotten, never be forgotten today and never be forgotten in the future. The Goldschläger collection contains over 3,500 volumes in nearly 30 languages from 44 countries from every populated continent on the globe. This collection will now serve research scholarship and learning at the University of Toronto. It will be a key point of continuing engagement with the Jewish diaspora community in Toronto, in Canada, and throughout both, both North America and the world. This collection joins the largest collection of rare, of rare Judaica Hebraica materials in Canada the, at the Fisher Library. And it is our deep honor to steward this collection, to preserve it for future generations and to make it accessible for research, scholarship and learning. Today, it is important as ever to remember the, the horrors and the terrors of the Holocaust so that such evil will never be repeated in the world. During the pandemic, we have seen a troubling rise in, in racism and in many of its forms, but in, in anti-Semitism uh, and dangerous hate speech, direct, hate, hate speech directed towards Jewish communities here in North America uh, and throughout the world. Through the memoirs and other records of survivors' firsthand accounts, we are reminded of what racism and hate is capable of if it is less, left unchallenged and unchecked. So thank you for your presence today as together we resolve to never forget what happened during the show up. I now turn it back over to Professor Bergen and, and Dr. Sharon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larry, for joining us today and for your important comments, demonstrating the library's commitment to its Judaica collections and to Holocaust research and education. Welcome again, everyone. I come to you from the University of Toronto's Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, where we had intended and hoped to host you all in person for this important event allowing you to see this, this majestic space, which you can see behind me uh, and behind Larry, and the selection of the books in this collection. Alas, the COVID pandemic had other plans and we were forced to transition to an online format. I will, however, uh, provide a glimpse uh, with the slides that you can uh, see now. Just a second. One of the main subject strengths in the Fisher Library is Hebraica and Judaica. Built over several decades, the basis of the Judaica holdings is several named collections, which, along with extensive holdings of the central libraries, support the teaching and research at U of T and its Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, the largest Jewish studies program in the country and one of the largest in North America. They are all made possible by the support of our donors, both financial gifts and donations of books and collections. And here we are today to inaugurate one such donated collection. Today, the date of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau is, as already mentioned, International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Among the purposes of this Remembrance Day, as set in the UN resolution that established it, is to honor the victims of Nazism, to reject any form of Holocaust denial, and to promote Holocaust education. Professor Alan Goldschlager's collection is intrinsically linked with these goals. The collection was born after Professor Goldschlager's involvement in the trial of the Holocaust denier Ernst Zundel in the 1980s. That involvement led him to realize just how important the memoirs of survivors are to counter the claims of Holocaust deniers. Subsequently, he began collecting this literature, which at the time, no other library was making a concerted effort to collect. What makes this collection most unique and important is not its size, although it is, as mentioned, one of the largest such collections in the world, but rather its temporal, geographical, and linguistic range. As mentioned by Larry, volumes in the collection are in nearly 30 languages from 45 countries from all over the globe. It includes 
Not only well-known titles and authors, but also many little-known memoirs published in various corners of the globe, often in small print runs. Some uh, quite soon after the war and even during the war itself. Over 140 books published before 1950 are represented in the collection. In addition to the physical collection, Professor Goldschläger compiled a database of books. Sorry, I didn't show the books. Uh, Professor Goldschläger compiled, compiled a database of books that are not yet in the collection, thus providing the basis from which we can expand it. Toronto and the GTA is home not only, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Sorry. Is home not only um, to Canada's largest Jewish community, but also to its largest population of Holocaust survivors. At the same time, anti Semitism and Holocaust denial are, and ignorance are all too present, including here in Canada. In fact, just yesterday, the media here reported a study by the Toronto organization Liberation 75 and led by a U of T graduate, which found that nearly a third of North American middle and high school students think the Holocaust was exaggerated or fabricated. All of that, along with the rise of hate speech and conspiracy theories, make the addition of Goldschlager's collection, which interconnects with other materials in our collections, such as the Chava Goldfarb archive, all the more pertinent. I will, it will undoubtedly become a cornerstone for Holocaust education and research at the University of Toronto and beyond. Thank you very much, Professor Goldschlager, for choosing the Fisher Library to be the new home for the collection you so methodically amassed over many years. Lastly, I want to convey my heartfelt thanks to Professor Bergen for partnering with me, even while being on research leave in producing this, this event, as well as to the Center for Jewish Studies and its wonderful staff. Thank you to my colleague, Jan, Sh Jan Shusmith, who has been working behind the scenes and organizing and running this event, as well as to the library's media production team, Frank and Nick. Thank you also uh, to U of T Libraries, to Associate Chief Librarian for Special Collections and Director of the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, Laurel McDonald, and to PJ Kerfoot, the head of the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections until his recent retirement, for all strongly supporting the idea of this event from its infancy. I now turn the screen over to Professor Bergen. Thank you so much, Nadav. It's been a real pleasure working with you on this event. And I too am thrilled, Professor Goldschlager, that your collection will now be in our library to be used by my students and by me. Um, and we, I'm promising, will make good use of it. I also want to echo Nadav's words of thanks and to add my gratitude to the Wolf family for their decades of support of Holocaust studies. Elizabeth Wolf, I believe you're here today. Thank you. And I also remember with gratitude your mother, Rose Wolf, former chancellor of the university, and your brother, Jonathan Wolf. Nadav has expressed, and I want to echo our gratitude to the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, its director, Anna Sternschus, acting director last year, Michael Rosenthal, Galina Weissman and Natasha Rakiki Fried, thank you so much. Warm thanks to Camilla Collins Ariza for all your help and to our assistants, Christian Tremontin and Therese Nakarato. I also want to thank Ellen Beaumont and Stephanie Carraza from the Israeli Foundation for their indispensable assistance for today. Now, if we can pull up the slide, um, to introduce our speakers, I want to start with the title of our event, Memoirs from the Fire, Acts of Salvage by a Holocaust Survivor, a Scholar, and a Collector. The Dove and I decided quite quickly who we wanted to invite to speak, but we had actually a challenge coming up with an appropriate title. Next slide, please. The first part of the title, Memoirs from the Fire, was Nadav's idea. He was inspired by this verse from Zechariah 3, verse 2. Is not this man a brand plucked out of the fire? That biblical reference, in turn, reminded me of a secular allusion from the scholar Raoul Hilberg, who described all empirical history of the Holocaust as, by definition, salvage. 
just as every Jew who survived was an exception. Every letter, every document, every poem plucked from the flames is an exception, the product of an act of salvage. Our panelists have participated in that project of salvage, each in a different way. Next slide, please. I'm going to introduce all three speakers up front. I'll give a fairly brief introduction, but a longer version, like you're seeing here, of their bios will be available at the link that I believe has been put into the chat. And just to let you know, we'll have all three speakers, then a short break, and then the question and answer period. So our first speaker you've already heard about, Alain Goldschläger, is Professor Emeritus of French Literature at the University of Western Ontario. As you can see here, he is a scholar and an international leader who has a long and busy career devoted to Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. He has published numerous books in French and in English and received many awards and accolades for his work. Thank you for being here. The next slide, please. Our next speaker will be Judy Cohen, herself the author of a Holocaust memoir. You see the cover here, A Cry in Unison and a Survivor. Originally from Hungary, Judy Cohen survived Auschwitz as a teenager. She is widely known within the field of Holocaust studies, both as a speaker and an educator, but perhaps even more so as the founder of a remarkable website, Women in the Holocaust, a cyberspace of their own, which has been going strong for 20 years and continues to be a very, very important resource. Today, in her presentation, Judy Cohen will read from her memoir published in 2020 with the Azraeli Foundation. Next slide, please. If we were in person as planned, we would have had a big table with piles of Judy Cohen's book, A Cry in Unison. She could have signed them, you could have ordered them or bought them, taken them with you. But instead, we have a link, which will also be put in the chat. You can order the book from the Israeli Foundation. And I put these slides here because if you don't grab that link or remember it, you can easily find the Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program, the Israeli Foundation, Judy Cohen's book, and many, many other treasures online. Thank you for being here with us, Judy. Our third speaker is Dr. Nama Shik, one of the world's leading historians of the Holocaust, whose work is a model of combining in an extraordinary way, rich empirical detail with empathic engagement with the people she studies. Nama Shik is director of the online learning department at Yad Vashem in Israel. And she's also the recent recipient of the Goldberg Prize for her forthcoming book, Jewish Women in Auschwitz-Birkenau, 1942 to 1945. Congratulations, Dr. Schick. Thank you for being with us. So we'll hear from all three speakers, one after the other. As you think of questions, please type them in to the Q&A function you find at the bottom of your screen. We'll take a short break and the question and answer will come at the end. Thank you again, all of you, and I'll turn it over to you, Professor Goldschläger. Doris, thank you very much. I feel very blessed to have been invited and uh, for the sake of time, I'll just start. Now that the collection of the Institute has found its new home, in the official library, cozy, cozy lodging, as it awaits the inquisitive eyes and mind of a new generation of scholar and student, I would like to share a few remarks about it. For years, <clears throat> I have insisted in my writing about what we may call the slipping narrative of the Shoah, one which increasingly fixes its lens not about 
the harrowing event of the war years, but rather upon survivor post-war experiences. This insidious, distorting narrative has also introduced several interpretations which erode the image of the Shoah, laying, I believe, the seed of questionable assessment in the mind of readers. It is now apparent to me that this troublesome evolution has today reached a culminating point. Indeed, we have witnessed a procession from a narrative of the Shoah to a literature of survival, which of course constitute an entirely different discourse. In the first instance, many survivors heeding Primo Levi Clarion called for a duty of memory, felt the urge to write and leave their experience for posterity. But the urge to write and leave their experience for posterity. But over time, their narrative lost its focus on the event themselves, even so far as relegated them to a remote background. And this, in a way, to oblivion. In so doing, these later authors often substitute a sunnier and more positive of their past and present life for the darker memory they emerge invariably of the original stark testimonials of the Shoah in all its degradation, even to the extent that they forsake the truth of the grim reality. It is precisely this vision that I should like to explore in the following remark. The Shoah is probably one of the history most keenly studied event. There is nevertheless a price to be paid for such sustained scrutiny from so many different angles and in so such a wide variety of contexts. This price in nothing less than the loss of the uniquely painful and dramatic human experience that it was. Pierre Nora, the no, notable French historian, has stated in, to this effect that the opposite of memory is not oblivion, but history. The advent of this perspective may be discerned in Raoul Hilbert's masterful pioneering study, The Destruction of European Jewry, in which the great historian neglect even to mention Primo Levi's writing and regarding Elie Wiesel indicates only that he presided over the Holocaust Memorial Council. Gilbert contended that testimonials were unlikely to teach him much of anything. It should be pointed out in the name of fairness that historians of the ensuing generation became more likely to lend an ear to the voice of the victim. Of especially value is the work of women historians, now I might speak of you, who refocus some historical inquiry on the material contained in testimonial. Another consequence of the dominant historical approach has been a synthetization of the event. Schematic simplification often as a mean of pedagogical framing has amplified the importance of certain symbols, in effect rendering them paramount. Auschwitz and the Warsaw Ghetto have of course received much attention as the ultimate references, but their preeminence tend to hide the complexity of the Nazi killing apparatus. As a result, they are perceived incorrectly as sufficient to describe the Holocaust, despite the more than 40,000 other camps and ghetto identified by the Washington Museum. 
Now, critical evaluation of testimonial li literature reveals the same phenomenon of progressive distancing of narrative and discursing viewpoint of the human experience of the war. After an initial wave of text exclusively centered on an implacable detailed account of prisoner survival condition, many written by author no longer alive, such memoirs were in fact often rejected by the public. In consequence, survivors refrained from telling their story. Beginning in the 80s, they reframed their narrative to accommodate the sensibilities of the readers. The war experience came to occupy a lesser part of the telling, even to the point where sometimes it is reduced to a simple, it was horrible beyond description. Through this process of narrative accommodation and perhaps self-censorship, the primary topic of discursive focus has become that of the resilience of the survivor and his or her capacity to rebuild her life after the Shoah. Inversion reflecting perhaps the North American psyche, always seeking a positive outcome, considerable emphasis is placed upon a happy ending success story. The peculiar tendency is doubtless reinforced by the presence of 55,000 heavily sanitized recorded interview from the Shoah Foundation as the narrative transform itself into a simple life, simple life lesson on how to transfer, transcend suffering. In the glorification of the resilience of some, but surely not all, one comes to forget what they really represent. Reader now seem barely uh, cognizant of just what minuscule proportion of those in turn finally returned from the camp. Is it worth remembering, for instance, that 85% of Auschwitz inmates died in the confine of the camp? And we don't speak of the death march. Concentrating on such narrative of a very small number of survivors may well efface the dark reality and minimize the almost incomprehensible scope of the tragic suffering endured by so many. This, of course, raised an obvious question. Can any text provide a true representation of an inconceivable reality? This is a basic question posed to every reader which enduring the urgency by Holocaust testimonies. It presents us with a famous conundrum. For all, although humility dictates that the answer to such a query should be no, the silence, which would be a true sign of respect, is not really an option. Silence would inevitably lead to oblivion. The gradual that we have observed in the corpus of testimonial literature has transformed the author from a witness to human agony to a preacher of a triumphant sermon of hope in the name of the victorious resi resilience. All other voices are ostracized. A reassessment of the initial vision may lead us to a more inclusive approach. As an example, it may, it may be instructive for us briefly to recon, reconsider the diary of Anne Frank. This extraordinary piece of writing rightfully deserves 
all the attention and accolade it received. But perhaps we should step back for a moment to evaluate it critically in its context. A book is in fact only the first chapter of the story of her life. She describes a period of tolerable, if unpleasant, condition, and herself did not write the second chapter of her story. However, Eti Lesum provided us in it vibrant description of her parallel experience in Western Park. Should we now try to envision an missing description of her life in Auschwitz? We would have to consider the tattooing of her number on her flesh and the public shaving of all her hair of her body, including her pubic hair with the unsharpened razor. How might she have expressed the pain she felt as typhus ripped through her body and soul? A chapter, remarkable though it may be, is not an entire book. And accordingly, we should presume as the reader to share in only one minuscule part of her experience. To forget all the rest of her martyrdom is hardly a sign of respect. Would it be blasphemous for us to say that in truth, the diary of Anfang <clears throat> is a fairly poor illustration of the Holocaust. The world she described still left her enough space to dream, whereas missing the missing destiny all but certainly forbade it. When I see a smile, I also see the face of a tortured woman. The later wave of survivor testimonies has helped obfuscate the factuality of the Holocaust, joining the original historical studies in relegating the savage individual experience of victim to the background. Most testimony written after 1980 tend to synthesize the horror of the war years in an introduction to the rebirth of a new life. They all use softened language to avoid the graphic description of suffering and torment. In contrast, here early testimonials take a starkly different tarak, since camp survivors were still inhabited by the horror they had only recently left behind and, it, and which still inform their vision of reality. <clears throat> One result of this later development is the character of the Shoah the, I mean, testimonial is that the voice of many survivors have been muted. Numerous survivors afflicted by their experience who suffer still today from mental disorder in the aftermath of the camp have not have long been neglected. 25% of the 140,000 Holocaust survivors living in Israel are currently experiencing poverty. No one hears their story. Indeed, in the consciousness of our contemporary world, they barely exist at all. They have become merely an impediment in, to the specious and simplistic notion that we have overcome historical calamity. As a student of the March of Living proclaim in Auschwitz when they sing, we are the winner. I would like now to tackle the central notion of hope to offer a reflective on the 
fundamental difference between the two approaches. Many survivor, so narrative from all period reiterate the belief that hope remains the essential foundation for survival. Hope, it is suggested, generate a resilience which allowed prisoner to overcome adversity. Yes, there is another, today more obscure face to this notion of hope, one which deserves our attention. An early text from our corpus points out to, a, to its various facet and effect. And I quote, despite the madness of war, we'll live for a world that would be different. Do you really think that without the hope that such a world is possible, we could stand a concentration camp even one day? It is that very hope that makes people go without a murmur to the gas chamber keep them from risking revolt, paralyze them in numb inactivity. It is hope that breaks down family ties, making mother renounce their children, or wives sell their body for bread, or husband to kill, because that day may be the day of liberation. Never before in the history of mankind has hope been stronger than men, but never also has it done so much harm as it has in this war, in this concentration camp. We were never taught how to give up hope. And this is why today we perish in gas chamber." End of quotation. For our purposes, the, strength, the central lesson here lies in the ambivalent to which the author of this line, Tadeusz Borowski, gives voice as he chooses to question the validity of hope itself in the context of the Shoah. Indeed, Borowski, like many survivors, including Primo Levi, committed suicide after the war. Later writer, it seemed to me, defined the notion without nuance or ambivalence in according to the morality and zeitgeist of the time. In such work, any complex understanding uh, of, its, of this crucial notion has all but completely disappeared. A similar of observation may be offered of the total picture of the to Shoah, which today, sadly, has become little more than a caricature. To return to my own preoccupation, I must confess that reflecting about the faith of the Shoah in the contemporary consciousness raises for me a personal, an anguishing personal question. <clears throat> Am I helping bury my own grandfather for a second time? Having missed the first time since he probably died in a cattle car in a train going from Chernovitz to Transnistria. Will his anguish and agony be erased merely for the sake of supposedly life affirming future. This is why I feel that it remains essential to connect and promote above all the early more forthright testimonials as well as those issuing forth from beyond the iron curtain of Eastern Europe or other country, and indeed in many language, which offer the richness of the various and nuanced perspective. This is at least 
would be a way of reducing the proportion of so many saccharine testimonials offered to the public in the American style. Even today, I am inhabited by a great anguish, wondering if I have done my duty in a way of that offers a worthy tribute to my grandfather's memory. <clears throat> Elie Wiesel told me in 2009, when we met in Prague, peut-être désormais la littérature est la plus apte à dire la Shoah. Maybe from now on, literature is the most capable of expressing the Holocaust. Now, as I find myself in the twilight of a career totally devoted to the study of literature, I should very much like to be able to affirm his prediction with enthusiasm. In all truthfulness, though, I must admit that I feel the possibility of a more somber fate. I thank you. Thank you very much for your words, Professor Goldschläger. And now we will turn the floor over to you, Judy Cohen. Um, and as I said, Judy Cohen will read from her memoir. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have some excerpts for my memoir. Uh, our existence in Birkenau, this most devastating place on earth, a place beyond all imagining was precarious. Loud screaming by the lager leaders of Achtung, Achtung, always sent shivers down our spine and inevitably meant selections, the most gut-wrenching times whose uh, worse even than hunger. We had to file in front of a camp physician, possibly the angel of death himself, Mengele, usually naked for inspection. Those who were considered too skinny or who showed signs of illness or had a rash were sent to their death by gas. The fear in anticipating these events engulfed me at all times. We never knew what would happen at the selection, which one of us would be sent to work sometimes in Ger somewhere in Germany or to another camp or to be guest. My biggest challenge was overcoming a fear of remaining alone. My stomach was always in a knot, bowels ready to burst because I felt safe only near my sisters. Eventually I developed a stomach ulcer. There we were facing moral tests and threats to our existence daily. But I cannot recall us four sisters ever fighting about anything. Mostly be worried. Our concern for each other withstood the most appalling and challenging conditions. Looking back, I see how each of us sisters endured every degrading and humiliating treatment in Birkenau while supporting each other <clears throat> and also with the skills, dispositions, and apprehensions each of us came with. Bershke proved to be a pillar of strength, always compassionate with a helping hand or word, just like at home, the most decent human being I ever knew and one whom I loved and admired. She was and is my greatest role model. Clary was very fragile like a delicate flower and from the very beginning without a smile. She was now in the place she feared most and had wanted to avoid at all costs and almost did, if it not had been for my father's insensitivity to her fears. Her melancholy would deepen with each passing day, though she expressed little emotion one way or another. Avi, easygoing and phlegmatic as always, found school friends from way back when and chatted away her hunger as much as she could or repaired torn clothes with the needles my classmate gave us. She also had a very pleasant singing voice and sang from time to time with some of her friends to everyone's delight. 
Most of the women in the camp stop menstruating very soon after our arrival. In a way, we were glad from a sanitary point of view. Some believe that the Nazis had put something in our food or drink to stop the menstrual flow. Others thought we stopped menstruating because our bodies were in shock. I remember reading an early memoir in which the survivors surmised that this was one of Hitler's rewards for Jewish women not to be able to have children even if they, they survived. Fortunate, fortunately, that wasn't the case. Every day we witness people dying. Some died from hunger, some from disease, some from exhaustion. During the never-ending roll call, some of the weather, uh, girl, girls would collapse and die right there and then. I saw young girls who could potentially be my classmates dropping to the ground. My memory is still vivid. Skeletal arms flailing, eyes moving in their sockets in what seemed to be like a silent plea to us, the still living, to help them. But we were powerless. And as they were dying, they defecated. These were dreadful, recessing scenes I didn't fully understand at the time. We were incredulous when we heard that the near dead would bypass the gas chambers and place straight into the crematoria, into the ovens to burn. Sometimes the dead were left unburied for a time and eventually inmates were assigned to this work would come around to collect the cadavers. These images gave me nightmares for a long time after the Holocaust and again as I started to speak publicly about what I had witnessed. These are weighty, gruesome memoirs, memories, difficult to shed, if, if I ever could. There was the shit wagon, as we called it, which came by every day as we stood for roll call. It was used to collect and carry the excrement from the pails that served as toilets around the barracks. Male prisoners pulled these wagons like horses. A reliable rumor had it that the Nazi officers would ask doctors and other professionals and intellectuals to step forward, giving them in the impression that they would have office jobs for them. In SS fashion, twinning humiliation with deception, these men were assigned to handle the excrement and pull the shit wagon. At first, we were continually appalled by the new information we learned. However, the shock didn't last, and after a while, we became used to the fact that we were in this dreadful environment. Those of us in Mexico did not work. We were like pigs in a holding pen. On some ways, the heat was bearable. There we were, no trees under which could find some shade, some relief. We had to stay outside the barracks during the day and we were idle and bored and, of course, thirsty. There was not enough water to drink and sunstroke was a serious problem. It is difficult to find the appropriate words to describe our pitiful existence. And yet, as long as we were together, four sisters, we felt fortunate. Our time was spent talking and sitting around in the dusty outdoors. Occasionally, we sang sad melodies. Luckily, there were some women within, uh, with beautiful singing voices. From time to time, a few of the women who had managed extensive household in the, pa in the past spoke and even boasted about their cooking and baking skills, even trying to exchange recipes. Hungarian women had a reputation for taking, making excellent pastries. After the Holocaust, there was a theory about women in Birkenau and other camps cooking and baking with their mouths. The theory was that thinking and talking about cooking was a survival tool. I was asked if young girls enjoyed listening to these conversations about food. My honest answer was no. Some may have felt that these conversations were helpful 
but I saw that they were obsegging for us, the younger women, who felt even hungrier and yearned even more for the unreachable as we listened to them. Some talented prisoners drew and <coughs> wrote poetry, but to do so you needed to somehow get a scrap of paper and a stub of pencil, items that were very difficult to obtain. It was also risky to draw or write, and you could be killed for it. It had to be done quietly in strict secret, unless you were talented enough to do portraits for the vain SS staff. If the Nazis discovered that you had a special talent they could use, there was a chance it would save your life. I heard that if someone played a musical instrument and was good enough to be accepted in the Auschwitz Orchestra, it could mean survival. The musicians mainly played for the entertainment of the SS camp officers, but also for the laborers as they marched in and out of the camp to their work sites. Some claim, but I'm not sure if it's true, that music was sometimes played at the gruesome time when people were marched into the gas chambers. One day at the beginning of August, around August the 2nd, we became aware of something very frightening happening in the camp next to us, known as the Gypsy Family Camp, where the Roma were held. There was intense yelling and the break, barking of SS guards and their dogs, and the screaming and crying of men, women, and children as they resisted being evacuated, but eventually they were all murdered. I am an ear witness to this event. I heard it all and I was terribly frightened along with all the others in our camp, thinking that we might be guessed next. We had no calendar, but I think it was a bit later around the middle of August 1944 that there was another huge selection. Amy and Clary were selected and sent somewhere. We didn't know where. They were in poor condition, especially Clary, but for the camp doctors, they looked healthy enough to work. We cried bitter tears. Thankfully, Bershka and I were still together, but we were no longer a family. I now slept with Bershka in a row with three strangers. Bershka was my sole family now and my guardian angel. Some of the prisoners in the camp spoke Russian and they helped my Bershka to learn the language. We already knew that the Soviet army was coming closer and closer. Bershka want, wanted to be able to tell the liberators in Russian, give me work and bread. She taught me that too, and I still remember those words. Shortly after Amy and Clary were gone, I got sick. I developed arthritis in my hips, which I still suffer from today. I was in terrible constant pain, and it was difficult for me to stand trending roll call. It was also difficult to stand up and sit down. After a while, I just could not function. But leaving me in the barracks would mean that I was sick and at risk of being selected to be gassed. And I feared selections more than I feared pain. Finally, I had no choice. Bushka brought me to the Revere, the infirmary, and they admitted me. Here, one barely had one own space. There was one long bunk and each sick person lay close to the next, almost touching. Sometimes I woke up in the morning to find that the person beside me was dead. Every morning a nurse and a doctor, both dressed in white, came to examine us. The nurse would take my temperature and the doctor would look at me and then write something on the card at the foot of the bunk. It was always the same whether you had a fever or not. You were given two aspirins, one a day in the morning and one at night. As it happens, aspirin is good for a curing arthritic pain. But you didn't know at what point those in charge might decide to clear out the revere and send you to, uh, to the gas chambers. The death drop, as we called it, 
with its huge headlights, would come around every single night, throwing frightening shadows on the wall through the windows. The orderly would come in and pull patients off the bunk, mostly the dead and near dead ones. I never knew when it might be my turn. This was a singularly terrifying experience. While I was in the Revere, Bushka would bring me the extra piece of bread she earned for carrying those heavy food cauldrons. I was reluctant to take it, but she insisted. She didn't want me to lose too much weight and become skinnier than I already was, and she would sit there watching me until I ate every last morsel. I am sure those slices of bread helped. Most likely she saved my life once again. When reflecting back on my time in the Revere, I wonder why the Nazis maintained, maintained it and seemingly kept accurate records of the patients. Perhaps it is because they wanted to have some kind of proof that they took proper care of the prisoner's health, though it was a deceptive sort of health care that they practiced, to put it mildly. After two weeks, I was allowed to leave. I wore the same clothes morning and night, so there was no need to get dressed. As I waited for a guard who would take me back to the barracks, I stood at the window, enjoying the sunshine on my face. When the guard appeared, he started yelling at me, What are you doing there? I'm enjoying the sunshine, I replied. Suddenly he slapped me so hard on the face that I fell to the floor. You have no right to enjoy the sunshine, he barked. This was the only time I recall being beaten by anyone while I was incarcerated. The important thing was that I felt much better, no pain whatsoever, due to the blessed experience. Our languishing continued as we did nothing and hoped to survive one day at a time. By the time we were used to the worst, so it was hard to get used to, to the hunger and the fear and separation and, and uh, of separation from Bershke, the unyielding hot sun without any shade and seeing the dying and dead around me. But so far, at least Bershke and I were still alive. We didn't know what had happened to Evie and Clary, and there was no sense in speculating. We only hoped they were alive somewhere. I was born on the Jewish near Rosh Hashanah and in, and in 1944 my sweet 16th birthday was spent in the shadow of the gas chambers. A bitter place indeed. Bushke gave me a hug and a kiss and we celebrated the fact that they were still alive and together. Then came Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, and a clandestine and haunting cornidry prayer with the women of Birkenau that could stay with me forever. Sometimes after Yom Kippur, I became extremely ill with high fever, diarrhea, and dysentery. I was terribly weak and could not think clearly. As fate would have it, while I was sick, there was another big selection. I don't know the exact date. I vaguely recall that I was selected to go with a group of prisoners and we were told to sit down naked and just wait. I have a hazy memory of seeing Bershke far away from me with another group of prisoners, looking in my direction and crying. And I wondered why. Eventually her group had to leave and she was out of my sight and I was still sitting there with this group without my Bushka, my guardian angel. Now I was alone. Fortunately, I didn't comprehend my grave situation. I knew that my good leather shoes had been taken away. The, the only thing I was allowed to keep when we came to Auschwitz, the only thing I still had from home, all of us, all those around me were without shoes and naked. I didn't understand a thing about what all that meant. I wasn't even aware that we were waiting there to be taken to the gas chambers. I don't know how long we sat 
Finally, a couple came with some fresh, dirty clothing and told us to put on, along with some clogs, shoes that had a wooden sole and canvas top. They looked like boots and were heavy and difficult to walk in it with our bare feet. But we had to get up and march. Along with the others, I dragged myself to another camp in the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex, the women's compound. We stayed there one night only. To my great amazement and luck, there we were two sisters. There were two sisters there, whom I knew from my home city of Debrecen, Edith and Shari Feig. I had attended middle school with Edith, and Shari, as she would tell me later, had been my brother Miklos' secret and frequent date. I was the same age as Edith, and Shari was seven years older. We were lying beside each other that one night on an upper bunk. They saw how very sick I was and asked me, Yutko, are you alone? I answered, yes, I am. Then Shari suggested that the three of us stick together. Just stay with us, she said. I think Shari took pity on me because I was so sick, but I felt so much safer not being alone. The next morning we were put in cattle cars again and the anti-group was taken to the Bergen Belsen concentration camp in western Germany near Celle. From then on, Shari, Edith, and I became inseparable camp sisters. We stuck together until the very end. Sistering with them certainly helped me to get better, and in fact, I recovered completely. A sense of belonging and knowing that someone cared whether I wake, woke up in the morning or not was imperative for sustaining my hope and ultimately saving my life. Now I skip over to a post-Holocaust era. Then one Mother's Day, my daughter, Michelle, who was enrolled in a women's studies program, surprised me with a book, Different Voices, Women and the Holocaust, edited by Drs. K. John K. Roth and Carol Rittner, two non-Jewish noted scholars in the United States. I was blown away by the writings of the scholars and survivors in this book, which is still a classic. I continued to read and educate myself about women's roles in ghettos and in the armed and unarmed resistance. I also learned about the immense suffering of women and their struggles to survive in the places I knew so intimately myself. It is clear that every Jewish woman, man and child was equally targeted for total annihilation as Jews first and foremost. And yet, exploring gender differences can, according to scholars, deepen our understanding of these events that defy comprehension. This does not mean competing for a place in a hierarchy of suffering. On the contrary, the aim of researching gender-specific suffering in the Holocaust is to hear the voices of all the victims, those who survived and those who did not, so as to enhance our understanding of history. Scholars agree that the voices and, on, and writings of women, women survivors comprise a unique genre, one that is driven by the twin circumstances of racism and biology, revealing women's double vulnerability, first as Jews and second as women. As Dr. Esther Fuchs states in her book, Women and the Holocaust, by ignoring gender, we stand to miss one of the most lethal weapons of Nazi propaganda and persecution. Antisemitism and misogyny were interconnected in the Nazi apparatus. End of quote. I could easily agree with premise, as I had felt the effect of both. With my new internet skills, for which I am forever indebted to my son, Jonathan, I began to read online as well, and I found at least one pretty 
extensive Holocaust website, remember.org. I email the editor and after I praise the content, I ask, and where are the women on your website? I soon receive the reply in the form of a question, what women? This was another pivotal point in my life. In year 2000, I decided that in addition to my public speaking engagements, teaching about the genocide of approximately half a million Hungarian Jews through my personal experiences within their historical context, I would have an additional task. I felt compelled to create a website dedicated to the women of the Holocaust, chronicling the horrors they experienced because of their Jewishness, as well as the added layer of gender and sex-related abuse that characterized the struggle of women to survive under Nazi yoke. I also felt drawn to this work by my memory of the Canada Commando. When we arrived in Birkenau, in the cattle cars, they are urging, give the children to the grandmothers in an attempt to save the young mothers. I was of the opinion that academia must not talk only to academia that all the significant papers, research materials, and knowledge about women in the Holocaust must get to a much wider audience, especially to students in universities and high schools. I was determined. And so with the friends' technical help and my editorial work, the site Women and the Holocaust, a cyberspace of their own, was created. The acknowledgement page credits everyone who has gracefully, graciously and generously helped in different capacities, including my dear and late husband Sid, who endured my who endured with job like patience the long hours I spent at the computer. I wanted to fill the site with education and material that would be a bridge between academia and the internet using public at large. I tried to construct something worthwhile that might become a good teaching tool on a topic that suffered from a paucity of public exposure. I hoped also that at least a few members of the next generation working in higher education would not just be interested in reading the material on the website, but would be inspired to study and research it further and one day teach it. One such brilliant undergraduate student who told me that I influenced him was Thomas Jardim at Trent University. He became a friend and a noted professor today at Ryerson University. Finally, a few, a few last words. I am now close to 94 years old in failing health coming rapidly to the end of my life and to the end of my story. Our children decided not to have children. What a pity. Or looking at the world today, is it? Still, I would have loved to cuddle a few grandchildren, watch them grow up, and see the continuity of the Weissenberg-Cohen family. Looking back on my life, is very much like re reliving it in a revised edition. Jotting down my memories has been a bittersweet, often traumatic, but also happy endeavor. Could I? Should I have left it unsaid? Let it sink into oblivion? Not possible. As the last survivor of my large family of yesteryear, it is my deeply felt obligation to remember and record the lives of all my beloved family members who once lived, worked, and loved, but who were brutally murdered in a genocide just because they were Jews, and also to record it all for my children, Michelle and Jonathan. It is imperative it was imperative to talk about the tragic and immensely painful Holocaust experiences that forged me and my outlook on life.
to record my experiences of how deeply intertwined the personal and the political were and still are. Now it was time to immerse myself in the varied, sometimes even humorous aspects of what my life has been. It was time to assess the difficult aftermath, the struggle to want to go on living and build a new life in an entirely new milieu, on treasured memories and on the ruins of what remained. It was time to truly appreciate the loving, lasting bond with my husband, our children, and extended family. It was time to take stock of my endeavors to contribute in a small but positive way to our civil society, especially an awareness that women's rights are human rights and that these rights must be understood and respected. It was time to look with open eyes and an open mind at the world as it is now, its magnificent progress, the many areas of development in technology, the arts, music, the sciences, and humanities, but also its multi-pronged unsolved problems, its seemingly irreconcilable conflicts. My generation is failing to tackle the urgent issues connected with climate change, to save the water, the air, the earth, and the forests, and it has also failed to bring about a much hope for global reconciliation. The hope, of course, lies in knowing that we humans can also attain greatness in goodness. We know that caring for others and saving lives, even when facing great danger, has happened many times. There are shining precedents among the famous as well as among ordinary citizens during the Holocaust and World War II. They ought to be our role models. The time has to come when future generations will search for and find a way to end this endless, senseless hate and find common ground for the good of all humanity. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Judy. And if we could be there, you would see that we are standing and applauding. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll turn to Dr. Nama Shik. Thank you, Nama. Thank you. It's, it's a great honor for me uh, um, to be here this afternoon. And thank you, Professor Bergen and Dr. Sharon and Thank you, Alain. This is, this is an amazing, amazing and so important collection. And especially thank you, Judy, for being actually really my, my role model, I have to admit, and um, for who you are and for the amazing website and for all the work that you're doing concerning women in the Holocaust and concerning human rights, which is, which is amazing. I, I will talk today about a, a kind of reflection of, is the Holocaust an event without witnesses or is it an event without listeners? In the spring of 1944, 50 female Jewish prisoners were marched in line to the gas chambers. The women who had already been in the camp for several months were certain that they were being sent to their death. And so their march was accompanied by a terrible wailing, terrible wailing. To their amazement, though upon arriving to the gas chambers, they were ordered by the SS men accompanying them to push 50 empty baby strollers belonging to infants who had been murdered the night before to the Canada One warehouse in Auschwitz I. The strollers were to be sent to Germany where they would be used by German mothers. The women's initial reaction was that of an immense relief. They were spread, at least temporarily. But immediately following this basic human instinct response, they were engulfed by the horror of the situation. They were young, some of the mothers themselves, 
and they were ordered to lead a procession of dozens of empty strollers in the midst of Birkenau. Giuliana Tedeschi, an Italian Jew who was sent to Auschwitz and was forced to leave her two children, two daughters in hiding, was one of these women. In her book, which, which name is the a place on earth, she described the women different reaction to their task. The mothers whose children were, were in hiding longed for them. Those whose children were murdered in Birkenau felt horrific pain. The women who had no children were thankful to God that they felt that they do, shouldn't have felt this horrific pain and they thank God for it. And then quote for the book, the women went, went through in a big door and stood in the hall. 50 baby strollers were waiting for them. The German ordered each to take a cart and push it in rows of five for three kilometers. The tension came down, yet each face was stamped with the, with the grimace of pain. The strange procession moved forward. The mothers who had left children behind rested their hands on the push bars instinctively, feeling for the most natural position prompting lifting the front wheels whenever they came to a bump. They saw, they saw gardens, avenues, rosy infant asleep in their carriage under pink and pale blue covers. The women who had lost their children in the crematorium felt physical longing to have a child in their breast while seeing nothing but a long plume of smoke that drifted away to infinity. Those who, had, who hadn't had children pushed their carriage along clumsily and thought they would never have any and thanked God. And all the empty baby carriage screeched, bounced, and banged into each other with the, with the tired and desolate air of persecuted exiles. End of quotation. Could someone else other than Juliana Tedeschi and the female prisoners who were with her can describe this horrific event. Dori Laub and Shoshana Feldman, Feldman sorry, wrote about those who gave testimony were describing the inconvisible historical occurrence of an event without witness, an event eliminating its own witnesses. The language of a testimony is limited in part because of because the limits of language, and in part because the trauma creates an absence of self within the only person who can talk about it. Additionally, what can be shared depends on the listeners or witnesses to the survivor. The listener's inability to understand what is being described, the desire for a clear narrative and the anxiety around bearing the burden of traumatic testimony. A description of a traumatic experience might be, might be possible to a degree and of course necessary, but understanding might still be elusive. What do we mean by understanding trauma? And what if the Holocaust is an event with witnesses, but no listeners? Can it be understood only through experiencing it? And when we research and remember a historical event, do we attempt to understand it? What, and what is this understanding that we so often talked about? Yolanda Gampel, she's an in, in, in Israeli psychoanalyst. She wrote about the relinquishing, the relinquishing, the need for certain for certainty, sorry, when truly listening to a survivor of the Holocaust, of trauma, and I quote, testifying is difficult for Holocaust survivors as it is for any survivor of state violence. At the same time, the opportunity to testify and even more so the opportunity to be heard is this survivor's only demand, yet, Hearing about laws that were trampled on, 
about human beings who had been broken, listening to the chaos, to the cruelty and crime, this demands relinquishing the need for certainty, end of quotation. This is difficult, complex concession for every person since we are forced to listen to something awful and scary which undermines our basic need to trust in men and in the world. One of the foundation of human experience is the ability to transmit knowledge of the body of the soul, a knowledge that can be shared and passed on, a knowledge that can be imparted through words, descriptions, that can be absorbed and spread further. Yet, there is the ever-present and constantly unsettling question, is it even possible to testify about the Holocaust? based on the perspective that says that those who experienced the true essence of the Holocaust were those who were murdered, who did not return to testify. And those who did return, the survivors, are sharing an incomplete and unfinalized finalized, sorry, experience. Is it indeed possible? And furthermore, those survivors who did share are, recount, are recounting events that cannot truly be transferred. There are no morals, no lessons, no solace. Survivors themselves agonize over the question whether the true, authentic even testimony can only be expressed by those who experience it to, to the full remaining painful ghost existing only on the whole of the constant discontent they create, whereas they, the survivors, the carriers of knowledge and storytellers remain powerless in their, in their inability to provide the words, language, meanings, and name. Rachel Hanan was born in May 15, 1921, in a small village in northern Transylvania. She, she is the fifth child of a family of eight children, born to her parents, Feibish and Ethel. She was sent to Auschwitz at the age of 15 on May 12, 1944, and entered the camp on her birthday on May 15. Only she and two of her sisters entered the camps as prisoners, and her entire family was sent to the gas chambers upon arrival. Two of her sisters were later murdered in the camp, and only she and one other sister survived. When we interviewed her on Yad Vashem a few weeks ago, and we are interviewing and asking questions, kind of asking, I would say that survivors are not rarely asked, are not, sorry, often asked. And, and we ask her, what would a person who was not there will understand? And she replied, and she replied in some, in some way she was angry in kind of, I would say, you know, angry about the person who asked the question, who resembled for her the whole community in a way, and she's projecting in a way also on the woman who was actually myself, who is asking the question. And, and she replied in a very, and she replied, I wouldn't wish anyone to ever understand this at all. I, I don't understand. So why would you understand, she asked me. And then she moves to, this, to describe her arrival to the camp. And she, she treated her mother in kind of a remote way because it's too painful. And she, she's saying this, a mother, while she's talking about her own mother, a mother who goes with the two little brothers, her two little brothers. She has no time in the selection, right? She has no time to say anything, except when on her way to the gas chamber, she said that we, me and my sister, that we have to go to work. She does not say anything else, like go in, like go in peace or something like that, nothing. Rather, she goes with the two little brothers and she looks at me and my sister and I look into her eyes 
And this was the goodbye for a lifetime. Here she almost shouted at me, for a lifetime, that was the goodbye. After she said, Rachel Hanan, I gave birth, to, gave birth to my children in Israel. I kept asking myself, how can a mother, again, she's saying a mother, she's not saying my mother, how can a mother endure this? How can, and here she said, she, how can she endure this? End of quotation. And yet Hanan felt compelled to tell, to give testimony. Someone needs to remain alive, as if speaking to himself, as if justifying his own existence. Those were the words spoken to my mother and myself, but by a survivor of Bosnian genocide. I went to Bosnia, to Bosnia Herzegovina to give lectures about the Holocaust, and my mother, who I think she's here, uh, uh, she came with me, and she's for, from former Yugoslavia, when, and she's a Holocaust survivor. When we're driving to the airport in Sarajevo and passing by the Jewish cemetery in the, in the city, he turned to my mother in Serbian and said, right here is my home. It was destroyed five times, but that, but that doesn't matter. This is where my father, uncle, and cousin were killed. This is where I myself fought with my friends, and my friends were killed. This is where we requested for me permission for the Jewish community to pass through the Tahara ritual a bathing room, emerging in the cemetery so that we could put an end to the murderous sniper shooting at, towns, at, at townspeople. When we passed by the National Museum, he turned to us and says, his, his face softening a bit from the pain that have just been etched on it. A sliver of a smile almost forming, maybe as a result of the comradeship that he was talking about, as comradeship always give hope. Here, nearby, I protected the Agadu, the Agadu. The Sarajevo Haggadah survived the Second World War thanks to the effort of the museum creator and librarian Dervish Korkut, a scholar, humanist, a, a cleric, teacher, educator, and orientalist who risked his life to smuggle the Agada out of Sarajevo. The Reichsleiter Rosenberg Task Force, an organization formed by the German to appropriate Jewish culture and artist property, arrived at the museum demanding the Agada from the director Jozo Petrovich. It was supposed, the Agada, to become a prominent piece in the museum of extinct race Hitler was planning. Petrovich told the German officer that Agada has already been taken by a different German officer. After they had left, he removed it from the safe and gave it to Korkut. He, in turn, hid it among his tools and smuggled it right under the, the watching eyes of the Germans to the mountains sur surrounding Sarajevo. He then transferred it to a Muslim clerk in the village of Zenitsa in the mountain of Biesnitsa, where it was hidden in a mosque. Kurkut and his wife, Servet al also hid and saved a young Jewish girl by the name of Mira Papo, later being recognized as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. During the Bosnian genocide, after the Haggadah had survived a museum breaking in which it was left on the museum floor, its value going unrecognized, it was once again hidden. This time, by the museum librarian, Dr. Enver Ivanovich. Ivanovich placed it in the underground vault of a local bank, which was safeguarded and in shifts by, a Bos by Bosnian soldiers. I also guarded it, he says. He then looked at my mother, who had already told him that she too was born in, in this country, that she spoke this la his language, and, and that she had survived the war in which most of the city Jews had, had been murdered. Tearing up, he spoke to himself about himself, saying, Someone has to remain alive, right? He looked at my mother as imploring, saying, 
someone had to stay alive to tell the story, end of quote. But can we gaze upon Medusa face without using a mirror? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goldschlager, Mrs. Cohen, and Dr. Schick for your important and moving presentations. Uh, we will put the questions and answers on slides um, so everyone can see them while um, Professor Bergen and I switch off uh, reading them to the panelists who will reply. First question, here we go. Seconds. Okay, the first question is uh, for you, Judy. Uh, the question is um, from Anais. I'm a U of T student and I would love to be involved in your project, Women in the Holocaust. I would like to create an Instagram page related to your website. What do you think? Uh, somebody would like to be involved in my yes. work. Oh, my could take it over all together. I am on my way out from this world. <laughs> uh, of course, of course, the person should, uh, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with me by my uh, uh, by email, and we can discuss it. I am I'm ready to give over the torch, and um, I'm glad I would like glad to see or hear that somebody is really interested in particularly in the gender issue. And uh, I gladly would be in touch with the person. I, I can't, I, there is no time to elaborate on it at the moment. But uh, you have my, I, I give you the uh, permission to give her my email address. And then I can be in touch with her. Thank you, Judy. That's a student from my class. So uh -huh. I know exactly how to contact her. Excellent. And thank okay. you for the question, Anais. Let's take the next question, um, which is a question for Alain Goldschläger from Patrick Imbert. I would like to hear more about your conception of hope. You were pointing out very clearly that it can be counterproductive. Alain, would you like to answer and tell more about your uh, conception of hope? Tricky question, and would you deserve a, a long uh, answer? Um, I took it because I think it, that notion and projecting the, well, giving the Borowski vision, because I think that indeed when you speak of the Holocaust, and um, it was uh, evoked, all the notions that we consider as normal, banal, basic, fundamental, all those notions were thrown by the windows. And every single concept has to be revised none of the measure or notions that we have in our life today, and now I'm, uh, when the direction two, were not valid. You couldn't, what is love? What is altruism? What is any of those notions or aggression? None of, if we, in the Holocaust, we cannot give any of those notion the value or expect the value that we have for them to be working. And indeed, uh, we saw everything in all direction. When you read the testimonies, you cannot expect ever somebody to react as it would have been in the world before or in your own experience. I'm sure that Judy would say, no, what you have the word, 
you, you can expect the worst and get decent reaction, expect decent reaction and be totally off. So hope, I took the notion of hope because it seems to be so basic. Um, I could have taken a, a Viktor Frankl notion of meaning and applied in the very same way. None of our reference values concept were valid to understand or to enter more into the Holocaust and the experience of the uh, of the victim. Judy. Yes, I I want to say something about this. Um, so, we are so often asked, where did you get your resilience to rebound with life? And my, my answer was, and this is very simple answer, we didn't have too many choices after the Holocaust. And but when you were young, like I was, you know, 16 and a half when I was liberated, uh, you had two choices when you found that almost all your family was murdered. Either you commit suicide or because you were young, you go on living. And you face the necessities, what you had to do, many things we had to do, uh, life skills to begin with. So we weren't, we didn't have the uh, luxury of becoming too philosophical. We didn't even know that we were traumatized. The word didn't even exist. We knew we had tremendous losses and there was a big void. But necessity dictated if you wanted to live, you start uh, from the beginning life skills and work and just assume the same life as every other um, struggling immigrant and the emotional was put on the back burners at that point you had no other choice so that's where the resilience resilience came from out of sheer necessity that's that's my very that's what i felt as and my two siblings who survived each two years older than i was we had no choices and we just we didn't speculate you know, philosophically. That came later, when we weren't hungry anymore, when we were uh, provided with the basic necessities of life. Not immediately, immediately just necessity. You know, this is a very interesting thing. What really became important to many, it was really proven in the Bergen, Belgian DP camp, how quickly people married. They needed a, a partner in life. There were men there who lost wives and children. There were single women all alone. The necessity to belong, to start creating some uh, human relationships again. That's what I saw was the basic necessity. Many marriages took place between people who wouldn't have married otherwise. There were say basic necessities. It wasn't mine particularly. But that was very important, eventually, a sense of belonging. And I saw that in the Bergen, Bergen, the EPCAM, how many weddings took place right away, and children. And then, then they made the mistake, sometimes couples, to make to name those children after the children who were murdered in the Holocaust. And those children, when grew up, some of them told me I felt like we are replacements. So, you know, there were so many things that were happening to us right away, but I don't think we didn't understand our own uh, situation ourselves. And that, that, that's where hope came. When we started working and established that we want to go on living, then we had to develop our own hopes. What is my, what, what is hope? to imagine what it could be under good circumstances, our lives. So this is my very simple answer as a survivor. It may not be very valid, but that's
That's what I felt, and that's how I went on living and my sister and my brother. Of course, we helped each other. <sighs> there are so many ideas developed later on, psychological and philosophical ideas that we had no luxury to entertain. We didn't even know we needed it. Thank you. Next question is coming up. Um, I think this question is for Naama, but perhaps um, Professor Goldschlager will have something to say as well. Um, the question is for Will and Klein. Please comment on the book House of Dolls and why Katsetnik's book books are now accepted. You're muted. No. Yeah, thank you. So the question is was about Katsetnik books and why nowadays they are accepted. Katsetnik book it's 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 a it's a good and big question, uh, and Doris of course can talk about it too. Uh, uh, I will say I will say I, I will I will try and answer shortly. Katsetnik to to, to 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 people who doesn't know his real name is Yechiel Denur. He, he terms his name Katsetnik, like, you know, someone who was in a Katset or in a concentration lager, as if he is a symbol of, of all the Katsetnik who were uh, in the camps. And his real name actually was, was known many years after he began to publish. And actually his books were very, very well accepted immediately after they were written. His first book was written in Yiddish and was translated to Hebrew very early in, in, in 1947. It was already translated from Yiddish to Hebrew. And in Israel, which, which is the largest uh, uh, um, survivor community, and then of course we have Australia and, and Canada and the United States, but it was, a, Katsetnik himself was kind of accepted as a historian, not only as a survivor, who wrote about his experience, which uh, but as an historian, but actually Katsetnik not he was not historian. He was he was a survivor, which suffers a lot, like all of the survivors, and and but he was perceived as historian. And Katsetnik also was. It doesn't. It's not gossip. What I'm going to say. It's reality, and it's important. He was married when he immigrated to Israel. I mean. Unlike Jody, it doesn't have to have resilience out of, of out of necessary. It doesn't have to, to do this immigration struggle because he married to Nina Asherman, who was a, 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 a daughter of a well-known doctor in Israel and a very wealthy a, a family at that time. And they kind of adopted Katsetnik and he didn't have to work only, only to write. And his book, they, they founded a, a Karen, Nadav helped me. I, I missed the word. Uh, they, they founded a charity. Sorry, thank you. That his books were actually, you didn't have to buy them. They were free, uh, 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 distributed in all school. They were part of the abitur. They were part of, of, of the final exams of uh, Israeli students in Israel. They were in every, every public library or in Israel. So there was huge accessibility to Katsetnik book and they were perceived and accepted immediately. And they're still today. You can hear from my words that there are some problems with it. And, and the problems go that, that Katsetnik in his books we have, he was a writer, okay, perceived as a historian, but there are, I'm trying to say it uh, uh, um, gently, there, there are some things in his books which are not correct, okay? Because he's a writer, okay? He's a survivor and he became a writer. He writes his story. And some of these mistakes were, especially in Israel, perceived or, or accepted as, as facts. And mainly the book that was asked about the House of Doll where, where Katsetnik is actually describing how his sister, Daniela, uh, um, was serving uh, uh, in... She, she, both, she, she was... Uh, um, 
She was serving in a brothel that, that was established by the Germans in, in some camp. And also she was what is termed like a joy girl uh, uh, um, for the German, which is, which is totally incorrect. It, it doesn't say that, that sexual abuse of women did not happen in the Holocaust, but the, the question of rape is different. And especially because of the, because of the Rassenschein, the in Nuremberg laws, Germans were not allowed to have to have sex with, with Jewish women. The consent of the women, of course, is not the question. The question is the, 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 ra the racial ideology, but, but w Jewish women were not, they were not allowed to be in these brothels established uh, uh, by the Germans, and they were not, because of ideological reason, what was termed German horse, okay? And, and, and Katsetnik, in his books, especially in the House of Toll, when he writes about it, and it was perceived as truth, we have many female survivors in Israel who actually, in 1949, 1950, 1951, took off the number the, the camp number, the Auschwitz camp number in a plastic surgery out of, or actually an outcome of, of many accusations that will keep on projecting on them. Uh, how come you survived? You know, this, this question why in Israel to a man, it was like, you probably survived and not my brother and my mother and my father who were sacred and, 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 and he murdered in the Holocaust. So to a man, the accusation was you probably were capo of someone who had to step on corpses. And to women, usually the accusation of how did you survive was you were probably using your sexuality in an immoral way or was either a German whore. And unfortunately, actually, Katsetnik uh, uh, have a role in this uh, uh, wrong conception, exactly. which actually made many, many survivors to suffer from this. So that will be my answer. Yeah. It's a, it's a, comp it's a complex issue because there were also uh, uh, instances where uh, exchanging food for sexual pleasure was uh, in, in a way uh, uh, something that forced on you for survival. Yes, and then yes, there, yes. And there were the other aspect when uh, Jewish women, some, some and others were exploited by the SS and, and the couples and everybody else. So there are two, two sides to this whole question of, of sexual pleasure for food or, you know, it, it's, it was also part of the survival uh, method for some women, and I saw it myself, and, and with other workers in the camp. It doesn't have to be a couple. As long yeah. as you had a, the uh, can of sardines, you could get some special favors if the, if the woman was terribly hungry and wanted to survive. So, you know, it's bad how you look at that. Definitely. But both existed, being exploited sexually and also a voluntary exchange, a sexual favor for sheer survival. Definitely. Both existed. Yeah. Thank you for those responses. And I think we're ready for the next question. We have a lot of questions. We sadly won't be able to get to them all, but let's see um, what is next up on on the roll okay a comment from joan shapiro thank you to all the speakers for your excellent presentations may you go from strength to strength your efforts are much appreciated and respected thank you joan for sharing that comment let's take the next uh question if we have nadav shall i take another um this is a comment from Murray Title, addressed for you, Judy, because it's a quote, thinking about my life is like reliving it in a revised edition. <laughs> Do you want to comment further? Who, oh, me? I, I should answer it? Yeah. Yes, please. 
Well, I, I answer it because revised because I have been looking at it as an adult. Uh, if it, when I, I started writing it at 90 years old, and I'm looking back at an era that happened many, many decades ago. So re, in that sense, it's a revise, but the facts are the same, but somehow I look at it differently today with the more mature eyes. And that's why I said it. it's a, it's, it's a revised. Uh, uh, I don't know what other words I should have used. But uh, it's an interesting endeavor to look back on your life, you know, and and and, and, and stay objective. <laughs> it's almost impossible, I think. But uh, it's not a very exhaustive, uh, uh, you know, biography. But uh, it's uh, it's just kind of testifying in a way, in a more uh, different than when I, when I make a public speech. Uh, my public speech is more political, usually. and But this is going into my childhood and whatnot, so I, I felt funny about it, actually, to try to gather all my thoughts. And uh, I was so sorry I didn't start it when my siblings were still alive to help me to remember certain facts from my childhood. But uh, yes, it was difficult to look back on my own life and my own action and and why I did it, and how I did it, and what were my feelings doing it, and, and all that. Too, too much self-examination. I don't know what Dr. Schlager, but by the, by, by the way, Dr. Uh, uh, Goldschlager, I just read in English the book Miert. Why? That Hungarian, I saw it on your exhibit, and I said, in 1946 already, she published it. It's an amazing book about the daily suffering of, of uh, it's, I, I, I don't think I could have done such a detailed uh, explanation about the daily suffering in Auschwitz and then in another camp where she was and, and remember it so precisely. Well, first of all, she write it right away after liberation. Secondly, she was 40 years old, a mature woman, you know, and uh, you bring, we bring about to our post-Holocaust life, a love from before, you know, how we were raised till I was 15 years old, the values, etc. so had some influence, but she was already a mature woman with established outlook on life, etc., etc., grown family. But I found the book, being in the same camp where she was at that, around the same time, it's an amazing memory that she had, how she put it together, that book. And I can see why you would have it in your collection. Basically because it was so early. The, have you read, uh, was it translated into French? Did you read it? Hmm? Did you read that book in English or in English? Yeah, sure. But one yeah. thing that I, I would like to say maybe, uh, because time is short, is Contrary to many um, memoirs of people having been in very dramatic situation, in in the case of Holocaust survivor, I, as far as I I know, the writing of the story was never a catharsis, which allowed for the liberation from the experience you know which in many other instances is the case so i think that uh, it's slightly con it's connected to the question that uh, its survivor wrote it but were not liberated one thing that i could mention um, is very very well uh, very few uh, survivor wrote several testimonies so even they may have done it early they didn't take back the task of redoing you know at a more mature with more distance they said it and it was kind of it is there and it 
it stays as a block. And if they speak about it, they, they repeat it, well, you know, more or less, uh, and they don't seem to feel uh, a need for rephrasing their experience. They said it once, well, of course, now immediately come to me uh, Primo Levi, but Primo Levi is a case never to consider <laughs> with other is such another. But the, so very few, statistically, very, very few uh, survivors have written several uh, testimonies. One, two, uh, they may have written other things, but their testimony is kind of expressed in one uh, piece of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time. Um, so uh, you've been uh, in the chat, you've been provided with the um, emails of our panelists. So if there are further questions that are not answered, and there will be any questions that have not been answered, uh, you are free to reach out to the panelists uh, via email. Uh, we will take one last question, I believe. Um, should be coming up. Okay, this is a question for all the panelists. Um, I would like to extend my respect to everyone who spoke today. Thank you for your words and helping us learn more. How would you recommend we and others who have interest uh, involve ourselves in the most appropriate manner in the studies and sharing of knowledge of the Holocaust? I didn't get that. I didn't get the question. Can we leave it on? Thank you. Yeah, for me. Okay. Who would want to start? Professor Goldschlager, please. Um. There is one thing to to read, to study, to try to understand. I think that that's one way, but I think alone may be a little bit not enough. And I think that if you really want to go deeper in the knowledge of the Holocaust, you have to start being active in your community. Unfortunately, so many people, immigrants or refugees are coming through Canada because of circumstances at home. And so that the complement of studying the Holocaust is start acting with refugees and people they don't leave the same thing, maybe, but they are getting their uh, experiences, which are exactly the, are of the same caliber very often. And that's why I try to say, um, and, and Patrick Bruckner, a great thinker in France, pointed out uh, by putting Auschwitz in such a Piedestal, you know, in such a place, it becomes that none other massacre and mistreatment of population can be matched. No, today there are horror similar as we, Judy mentioned, and I wrote about trying to create a scale of suffering, a hierarchy of suffering is deeply immoral. Suffering is lived by all of those people. And understanding the Holocaust would be to go and act in your community and help refugees, people having been in camps, Think, let's think of what's happening uh, today in the Middle East, in Asia, 
the Yazidi, the, the Rohingyas, and all of those are living parallel experiences. And knowing one is understanding part of the other. Uh, I, I would like to say something if I have time, because uh, I am, have been a public speaker for 29 years, and I evolved. Uh, uh, assessing what is important. Now, it also, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I started speaking to teach people with uh, what I had to say. And this is what I normally would say, and I'm going to read it to you because it's part of my all my speeches that, in my humble opinion, if we have anything to learn from the horrors of the Holocaust and from subsequent genocides, for relevancy is not from the suffering of the victims alone, even though it is imperative to remember and honor them, but rather we need to study in depth the road, the legal and political decisions and social processes that led from the first violation of home human rights to all rights, from closing down the first Jewish business to target them all, from uprooting the first Rome of family to murdering them all, from burning books to gassing and burning women, especially pregnant women, men and children. The political process that led to that terrible suffering, if we want to learn anything for the future uh, or what's happening today, to me that's so important for young people to learn that, that it was governmental political decision that finally led to the gas chambers. You have to know about one day conference first before you see the gas chambers to know where it comes from. You know, we had five people of those who decided to, to have gas chambers, mass murder of Jews, as had, had higher education, master degrees. So when we talk, think of education, so it's a complex issue you know, why we should remember, but furthermore, why we should remind. I, to me, I had a, a very definite, it wasn't catharsis for me. It was ba basically to learn what I think we should learn the lessons from the Holocaust if we want to create a better world for the future, for the kids, for the, for the grandchildren. At least that was a very personal ambition of mine. Whether I achieved it or not, of course, I don't know. And and I also spe specialized for the time being for on the women and the Holocaust. But, you know, there is, we have to be practical about this remembrance business. You know, why are we doing it? As you say, Dr. Goldschlager, you can't transmit feelings, the suffering. It's very personal, and it was different with each person. But we can also think logically and 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 practically, and uh, what called real politic. What was it all about? The whole mess of 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 annihilation of whole people, the political aspect. What triggered it off? What were the uh, <laughs> what? I mean, I, you have to go back far back, you know, to the First World War, but I have a feeling if we really want, uh, and also this this this, this uh, gentleman that I greatly admire, uh, Daniel Peneton, who, who, who said that Holocaust education must expand its focus to include democracy and fascism. In other words, there are so many issues for which we should be speaking besides talking about our suffering. I, at one point, started to t talk very little about it, enough that to know that that was the end game. But there were other reasons that we can find today, reasons why should we worry what's happening with this endless uh, hatred that we're facing. Where does that hatred come from? So, I don't know, I suppose we're all different, you know, survivors, may have the same experience and, and derive different conclusions. Uh, but that's how I feel about it. I, uh, if, we want, if we really want to teach 
uh, next generation uh, what are the important lessons of, of, of uh, uh, those 12 years. Uh, from 30, uh, 1933 to 1945, what happened to culture, what happened to thinking, for education, how it was used, everything involved, and that arrived to that kind of uh, uh, endeavor, like we call the Holocaust, an unprecedented uh, ambition to murder so many people, for, for what? Miért, right? The question, Miért is a Hungarian word, why? That's the uh, uh, title of that book, and it's a very interesting book. I was, I was really absorbed in it, in her talent, how she put everything. So we, we're, uh, we're different. Even survivors are different, and different uh, way of inclined there politically, ideologically. It's. Um, um, it's like everybody else, and like the whole world. We're divided in so many, in so many ways. Uh, if we really want to solve the problem of this, of this senseless hatred, stemming from wherever, religious, ideological, um, uh, I don't know, everybody's calling it racism. I think the whole idea of racism is such a misnomer, you know, it, it, it is more uh, uh, the hatred of, of uh, different cultures, different ideas. Not, I think there is only one race, is the human race, and everything is aside. What do you think, Dr. Goldschlager, at this racism business? Let's bring uh, Dr. Schick for the last word. Okay. Let's bring Dr. Schick for the last word. <laughs> I, I I totally agree with, with Alan and Jody and, and I think I would say like last sentence if you ask me, I think you have to have uh, eyes to see and ears to hear and and not to be as a bystander as, as much as we can. But first we have to have our eyes open and see in the community and see the other people who are suffering and going through things and, and we have to have ears to hear them and to be empathic listener. And I think that we, by, by this empathic listening and understanding the emotional situation of the other that we are talking with, that brings us not to be a bystander and that bring us uh, uh, to do something better, I think, as we all really, really hope and want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this is a good point uh, at which we could and should end. Um, there have been many questions that we haven't been able to get to, um, unfortunately. It's time ran out. Um, but there have been, there's much to think about and reflect upon, uh, which came on here. Um, I don't have anything to add, um, except that I will have to reflect upon this uh, myself a lot. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the time and effort that you've all made, uh, especially our panelists um, and specifically Nama. It's almost midnight uh, for Nama. Um, thank you very much. And I hope uh, we can all meet here at some point in the not too distant future and actually look at the books um, and reflect upon them uh, in person. Uh, Professor Bergen, anything to, nothing to add. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.